Tyler Webb, welcome to Sports Management Podcast. Thank you, Marcus. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well. I'm uh, happy to finally speak to you. You have a beautiful setup. So for those who chooses to watch this on YouTube, uh, they can see that. And if they um, use Apple or Spotify or anything else, they will listen to your voice instead. Well, I hope they enjoy the way I look. And if not, then you should go to Spotify and Apple and just listen to me instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So for those of you who might not know who you are, you are a sports marketer and the co-founder of uh, Uncle Charlie. So can you yes. tell a little bit about your background and uh, how, why you co-founded Uncle Charlie? Yeah. So my story in sports marketing uh, specifically goes all the way back to when I was in high school. Um, I, I often tell the story. Uh, there's a guy that, you know, I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin initially, so uh, a pretty small town. Uh, and a guy in, in Green Bay had started a Twitter account called I Live for Football, and he was 14 years old at the time. So I think that name is sort of reflective of what a 14-year-old could could come up with when he's interested in, in football. And uh, he had grown this Twitter account, just reposting NFL highlights and college football clips and stuff like that to 10,000 followers. And, you know, it was probably back in 2013, 2014. And um, at the time, and, you know, at the age of 14, 15 years old, that was super impressive. Like I was almost starstruck when I, when I met him and he told me how many followers he had on, on Twitter. And uh, I didn't know much about how he did it or what it took to do it or what that sort of thing could even lead you to. But I was just so enamored by uh, the fact that he was able to reach that many people on a monthly basis. And I just offered my hand to help. And at the time I had no experience in uh, any sort of sports content or marketing. I just knew I wanted to be involved some way because I thought it was really cool. So uh, I offered to help my sophomore year of high school. I was 15 years old. And um, through that account and, and, and that partnership, I'll give him a shout out. His name is uh, Frank Kugel. He actually went on to do the social media management for the Miami Dolphins. So mm -hmm. his, uh, you know, that Twitter account ironically led him to, you know, to a career um, in, in football specifically. But he, uh, you know, we grew that account with with a team of guys that were just from our area and uh, grew to 150,000 followers um, up until the point I, I left for school uh, to go to college in, in Minneapolis. And uh, it was a really cool experience. It just opened up a lot of doors for me, to be honest. It was like the first time I realized that, you know, having some amount of online following uh, you got you in rooms or got you in conversations that you might not otherwise be in. And it was also just a great social proofing tool to be like, hey, you know, I am competent enough online to, to build an engaged audience, a community. And, and people really respect that. And that was a really eye opening thing for me where I was like, oh, this skill that I didn't really know was a skill, you know, to build a community and um, curate content and create content was a valuable skill. I, I just thought it was, you know, doing what I had been doing through high school, which was growing an audience and tweeting, but a lot of people saw it as, as valuable and something they were willing to pay for. So throughout school, I, I had a bunch of freelance opportunities to do social media management for people. Um, and that led me all the way, you know, that was my part-time job throughout college, essentially. Um, and then when I was about to graduate, uh, COVID hit, as everybody knows. And so basically all my job prospects went up in the air. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, I've been doing this freelance thing throughout college and I really liked it. And I liked the flexibility and I liked being able to pick the projects I was going to work on. And so I just decided to do that full time starting in uh, January of 2021. Uh, and that led me to working with a lot of sports clients. That's where my interest lied. That's where my, you know, my interest always had been. And so, you know, in the ability to pick who I wanted to work with, I, I opted for a lot of, a lot of sports clients and in doing that, I met my eventual business partner and uh, we, we started doing so much work together as, as freelancers that we're like, you know what, we should probably formalize this relationship a little bit. And that's how uh, uncle Charlie came to be. And we do the you know, organic and, and social media marketing and content for uh, sports leagues and teams and, and organizations across the country. So I always like to reflect on that story and say, you know what, it's, it's cool how some Twitter account that had 10,000 followers at some point sort of kickstarted my career. But at the time, I, you know, I could have never have guessed that would have led me here. I, I, you probably couldn't have convinced me that that could be a job that people would pay for. But it is, and, and I'm lucky to be here. Yeah, and it's an important job. And uh, I mean, nowadays, uh, I mean, the, the traditional media has, to, it has changed the media. We are more online, we are more social media. And you said like, that you grew this Twitter account uh, together with this guy up until 150,000 followers. And I mean, you're reaching so many people so easily. So when you say that you help grow, what is it that you do? And when you help these sports orgs, et cetera, what is it you do to help them grow? 
Yeah. So the big differentiator these days is content. So, you know, you probably hear if you at all exist in the marketing world, you, you hear a lot of people toil over the algorithms and how the algorithms are changing and how you know, all these platforms are asking you to do different things and prioritizing different things. And, you know, at the end of the day, the biggest thing you can control, because you, you can't control any of those things, right? You, you know, you can't control what the platforms are favoring. You can play into it, but you can't control it. So the, the, the biggest variable you, you can control is, is the, is the content, obviously. Um, and especially making, uh, original content that uh, is, you know, differentiated to your audience. So I'll dive into that a little bit more. So for sports teams specifically, there is this inherent, uh, benefit that they have. It's like this baked in benefit where people care about the things that they do. You know, like if, you know, Marcus, you or I were to start, uh, a brand new Instagram page or TikTok page, nobody knows who we are. Nobody really understands what we do. They don't care. They don't care inherently about the thing that we're talking about, right? But when you you have a sports team, I'll use the Green Bay Packers as an example. People are going to follow the Green Bay Packers because they're a fan of the team. You know, they're a fan of the product on the field. And even if they put out subpar content, they're going to follow along because they just think they should because they're they're a fan of the team. So, uh, what sports teams have to be careful about is not to fall into that trap of being like, oh, people are just care about us anyway. We don't have to try super hard. Mm -hmm. um, but where the teams and the organizations have the most success is when they double down on that built-in attention. And they say, you know what, we're going to invest in content. Uh, we're going to showcase our team or our players, our coaches in a way that has never been seen before. You know, the benefit of social media now is that we get this kind of immediate access the way we never have before. There's no gatekeepers anymore where, you know, a player has to go onto a show to get interviewed. And that's how you learn about them. They can directly talk to you through their own accounts or through their team's account. So, you know, the teams that do the best really invest in that content and really invest it in a way that, uh, is unique and different and, you know, sheds a, sheds a light on whatever it is they're doing or the, you know, the personalities or the initiatives they're undertaking uh, in a way that has never been able to be done before, be before these platforms came to be. Yeah. And, uh, you need, I mean, what type of content you put out that always changed. Now they say that video is king before it was long, yeah. uh, long form content, uh, short form mm -hmm. content and behind the scenes content now with all these you know the netflix series now both with the tennis that came out recently and before yeah those course, are great yeah and drive to survive so is how do you i mean work with that to differentiate content where do you see the most value mm -hmm. so there i'll break this down to a couple things so I listened to a podcast with Mr. Beast, who a lot of people probably know, you know, the, the most popular YouTuber at the time, uh, currently. Uh, and, and he made the point, which I thought was really interesting, really encouraging, actually, where he said, you know, there's never been a better time to create content for anybody, sports teams, individuals, because right now, every, every platform is chasing TikTok, which means every platform has some version of a vertical video that should be around 60 seconds long, right? You know, there's Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts. Snapchat has a product, Facebook's introducing reels. Even on Twitter, you can post vertical video where when people open it up, it starts to take up the whole screen and then people can start scrolling through vertical videos on Twitter. So on every platform, you can repurpose a piece of content that you shoot to look a certain way and to you know, engage people in a certain way. And it's, you, you see these sort of like quick moving pieces of content that have a beginning, middle and end baked in within 60 seconds. And you can distribute that across every platform. So, so in that sense, it's like, it's been a, it's a great time to create content as somebody who does it for you know, myself and for other people where I can take one piece of content, make it in a certain way, and then post it across five or six different platforms. So in, in that sense, it's great. But you also have to understand um, with each of these platforms to come back to their algorithms that uh, when people see your content, so you know, speaking to a sports team, they they know about you in a different way, or they come across this piece of content with different amounts of context. So, I'll use the example of Instagram versus um, versus TikTok. So, on Instagram, a lot of the content you see is through your homepage. You've opted into following somebody, so you know presumably who they are, what they're about. You know, you understand if they're a sports team, at what level they're playing at, who the players are. There's all this built-in context you have when you choose to follow somebody on Instagram. On TikTok, you're scrolling through a purely recommendation-based feed. So you don't know what the next video is going to be. That's part of TikTok's appeal, right? But that comes with the fact that there's no context built around who you are. So somebody, Marcus, might come across one of you or I's videos and they don't know that you have a podcast. They don't know that I own a marketing agency. So whenever I start, you know, when I start talking, they have none of that background information built in. So you have to create the content with a different uh, premise in mind. So when I talk about creating content on TikTok specifically, I talk about having to have a premise built in. And obviously the way TikTok's done that for a really long time is having these trending sounds or, you know, trending memes going around where 
Um, if you hear sound right away, you understand the premise. You're like, okay, I've seen this before. I know what the, uh, the hook of the joke and the punchline of the joke is going to be, or I know about where this video is going without having any information about who the person is. You kind of get an idea of, of where the content is going. So it's really important on TikTok to have that premise built in. I do a lot of content built around, uh, just storytelling in, in sports. So I'll start off each video with a hook that is a little bit sensationalized, obviously, to get people to keep watching because those first couple seconds are really important. But also in those first couple seconds, I I lay out what I'm going to be talking about. So I say like something like, you know, this, the Kansas City Chiefs almost got to host a Super Bowl, but then this happened. What was it? And all of a sudden, I've just set the stage for what I'm going to be talking about. And somebody wants to keep watching to find out, uh, you know, the, the resolve to, to that hook. So um, to come back to that point, to speak specifically to TikTok, that premise has to be built in. Other platforms, you can probably get away with a little bit more um, casual content. So Marcus, I'll answer your question more specifically about what content people should be posting. Um, I think on Instagram, it's this you know, really visual heavy content, stuff that lets you to get to know players a little bit more. Um, since somebody, if they're following your, your football team, let's say, they're going to know who the players are because... Presumably they choose to follow you. They they're, they're bought into the team. So you can get away with doing stuff. That's a little bit more personal, a little bit more behind the scenes, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, you, you can get away with more because there's already this background information built in. Whereas on TikTok, you know, it's probably beneficial to hop on trends. It's probably beneficial to do a bit more storytelling or do a bit more um, narrative building. One thing that I don't think people on TikTok have fully taken advantage of is you can post longer form content on TikTok, you know, stuff that's like two minutes plus, you just have to make sure there's there's really good um, story built into whatever it is you're talking about um, that bring people along and keep people interested. But as long as you're able to set the stage and deliver information in a concise and engaging way, people will sit around and, and watch a video for two to three minutes on TikTok um, as you continue to extrapolate on, on the context that they might not otherwise have. So um, those are the two platforms that I talk a lot about with our clients, um, you know, to speak to like Twitter and Facebook. Um, Facebook is kind of in this no man's land where it's trying to be a little bit of everything. So in turn, you kind of post a little bit of everything to that platform and you understand that just your most engaged followers are going to be seeing it. Um, you're not too concerned with growth on that platform. And, and Twitter is really like the, the, the centralized news source for a lot of people, right? So timeliness and chronology are really important on that platform. Less so the, the visual appeal of a something, you know, you can just put out a post with just text. It doesn't have to have media attached to it. So understanding that, you know, speed is really important on that platform uh, is also something people should take note of. Yeah, I think that are great points. And uh, like with Twitter, for example, if you're writing longer form content, you can break it down and make it a Twitter thread and try to, you know, recycle your content to get as much as possible. And the same with the videos, but it's a good point, as you said, that, that maybe on TikTok, you need to be a little bit different from Instagram because the audience might be different. So yeah. is, is, would that be like your best advice for the sports org and other, you know, sport related companies uh, with regards to social or what other like uh, tips and tricks would you say are important? Yeah. So that, that's a good question. So I think my first piece of advice is always, if you want to grow on TikTok specifically, you have to think about that platform first. You cannot think I'm going to make something on Instagram and then I'm going to post it to TikTok after. You have to think I'm going to make this piece of content for TikTok. And then, as I mentioned earlier, everything's copying TikTok. So then I can just post that TikTok to Instagram and to YouTube and to, to every other platform. So first piece of advice is to think of TikTok first and then work backwards, um, work backwards from there. Uh, my, my second point is, as I talk about how you know, important it is to play into uh, what is working on each platform, um, I, I really want to hammer home the point that the content is the most important thing. I mean, I think it's really interesting. Like you see this with now... TikTok has photo carousels, um, which seems totally counter to where we thought this whole social media thing was headed. We're like, okay, now everything's going to be vertical short form video after TikTok came to town. But all of a sudden, TikTok is reverting to photo carousels for some reason, which is totally like Instagram circa 2014. Um, and a lot of people are having success with photo carousels because they're able to tell a really compelling story. So as you look at this stuff popping up, that might seem counter to what you believe. I think that the core of it is really, you know, how interesting the story can you tell, how you know, vulnerable or, you know, behind the scenes can you get, uh, how, how much can you peel back the curtain on things that people actually care about? And it doesn't really matter what format you post it in, uh, whether it's a long Twitter thread or, you know, a post on LinkedIn, like there's all these different mediums. It, it, I think it's more about your ability to um, share the content in a way that's compelling and engaging. And for a lot of people, that means a lot of different things, which I know is a total non-answer and something probably 
people don't want to hear. They're like, oh, I just wish this guy would give me like a, a solid answer. But I really do think you need to focus on the content, basing that around the people and the rest, you know, the format or the platform you, that will kind of figure itself out. So mm. sorry for the non-answer, but I, I, I really had to get that off my chest. Of course. That's interesting. Talking about organic versus paid marketing, what's mm -hmm. your stance on that? I think organic marketing, uh, what, so the short answer is I think paid is an add-on for organic marketing for most, for most sports organizations. Um, I think organic sets a really important foundation um, for everything it is that you do, for the experience that people can expect, um, for you know, the personalities of, of the players for the building of the stakes, you know, like why should somebody come to a game? Why does this game matter? Why does what this player doing matter? Um, any of those sorts of things. I think, I think organic is responsible for laying all that groundwork. I think paid is really effective for driving home information around a specific initiative or a specific point. So the one thing that frustrates me oftentimes with sports organizations is they're like, okay, we have to put up this tweet about this ticket deal that we have coming up and you put up the tweet and it maybe gets a third of the impressions that any other tweet would get about a player or about a game or something like that. And they're like, man, why, you know, why didn't that do so well? Normally our tweets get 10,000 impressions and this one only got 3000 impressions and you have to think about it and you're like, okay, well, you know, what's the value of somebody sharing this tweet or, you know, liking this? It's, it's really an informational source, right? It's not something that's engaging or that you're going to spend any more time on than reading it, understanding what it's saying, and then moving on, right? So paid is really good because it's a, a blunt force instrument where it's just going to beat people over the head with this information. And sometimes that's what it takes. You know, sometimes somebody has to see a ticket deal four times before they decide to act on it. Uh, and paid is really good at that. Organic, not so much, you know, somebody might see it, recognize it's something that's trying to sell them something and then move on. So mm -hmm. I think organic's going to lay the groundwork for the experience and the personalities and, uh, you know, the stakes again for an organization or for a player and the paid component will just hammer home the information that's a little less sexy, uh, but that needs to get distributed regardless. Mm. I think that's a good point. And also like thinking about my own experiences, if I see something that says paid, I get a little bit more like skeptical right away. Mm -hmm than yeah. if I see something organic and I mean, it might be the same company, the same, whatever. And, but like just that thing makes it, you trust something more if it's organic. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly interesting. I think the best paid strategy mirrors organic as closely as possible. Like to your point, Marcus, I think the the best paid content, you don't realize it's paid until you're already like three or four seconds into intaking the information. Right. So, um, you know, one thing that we as paid managers will look at our different metrics like a thumb stop rate or a hold rate. And that basically just measures how many people are watching this piece of content for at least three seconds um, before they decide to move on or how many people are watching this piece of content all the way through before they move on. And if you can get those numbers to be like, you know, over a third of the people that come across your content, watch it for a while, you know that you have a good piece of content because I'm not going to say you've tricked somebody into watching it, but you've um, conveyed information in a way that's so engaging that they didn't even realize they were being sold to until the point they realized they were being sold to. Uh, and you know, by then you've already got them to take an extra second to consider whatever it is you're proposing to them. So I think that's a, a an astute point where you want to meld those organic and paid worlds together where the line does become a little blurry. And, and that's intentional on, on our part as marketers. Mm. Yeah. And something else in your role is that this says that you are uh, Facebook ad campaigns, that you're managing that. So mm -hmm. what, what does that mean exactly? What is it that you manage? Yeah. So that comes back to the, that paid component uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned um, as I crap on Facebook earlier in this <laughs> discussion. Um, I think one thing they still do well is they serve ads to a lot of people um, and they do it really effectively um, I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this that have ever run Facebook ads might be a little frustrated with, you know, the, the, the product as a, you know, a technical platform, you know, there's always little quirks and bugs that they seem to never figure out as quickly as you want. But uh, in terms of getting ad creative to people in the most cost effective way, I, th I think Facebook still is, is really, really good at that. And they have a really solid suite of tools built out to help you sell product and, um, you know, again, that I think that's sort of their core competency these days um, over the organic side. The the issue with Facebook is that you have to have in an audience that's coming to the platform for um, organic content to make the paid stuff work. So they're going to have to constantly balance that 
by not oversaturating their platforms with ads um, and just turning it into a, you know, just like capitalist dystopia where you only come to the platform to get served ads of, of things to buy. Um, but until that happens, uh, it's still going to be a, a really powerful platform. And again, a really great way to beat people over the head with information that they might not otherwise be engaging with on organic social. Hmm. I see. Um, I asked this question to a previous guest on this marketing aspect and uh, got some pushback. So I'm giving it a second try with you here. Let's uh, do it. <laughs> what are the biggest challenges uh, that you see on the digital side uh, in the sports industry? I think from an executor of sports content, so from somebody who creates a lot of the content, distributes a lot of the content, it's assuming that one person can handle the now five or six platforms that any team organization is expected to be on. So for a really long time, the role that I currently hold with a lot of teams or like the, you know, what my agency helps a lot of teams with, that would be called a community manager or a social media manager. And that implies a really passive role of things happening. You know, you getting an input of content, the manager, and then they, you know, do something to it. There's some input, they spruce it up a little bit. And then there's an output where they, you know, post it on social media. And for a long time, that meant tweeting text only things on Twitter, or it meant posting graphics or single images to Facebook and Instagram. Uh, but now all of a sudden, as we have this conversation about vertical video, there's an increased barrier to what content should be on social media. And, and frankly, I think that's a good thing, right? Like these mm -hmm. platforms have gotten so mature to where we're not just sitting there and thinking that some grainy picture is like quality content. Like we as consumers have this higher bar and this higher expectation of what content should be. And I think that's totally fine. And I think that's totally to be expected as these platforms mature. But it seems like the expectations of a role, like what a social media manager is, have not followed that maturation uh, in you know in tandem with the platform. So now all of a sudden you have these people who are oftentimes not making a lot of money, have really crappy hours, and they're expected to be able to do graph design, video editing, um, be the face of a short form uh, content account. Like they're expected to do all of these things that five, 10 years ago, they were not expected to do, but it seems like their pay hasn't increased. Um, the amount of help or human capital or any you know software resources hasn't really increased. And so I think the biggest issue right now is understanding that uh, a lot of these roles, specifically talking about TikTok or you know, graph design are now individual roles. Like it's great to have a person that can understand all those things and maybe even do a couple of them pretty well. But if you want to have a lot of success, you have to be hiring graph designers. You have to be hiring video editors. Now I think you have to be hiring TikTok creators, because that's such a different beast. And the understanding of what works on that platform almost takes an individual person to handle and to tackle. So, you know, I, I think what these organizations and these teams need to realize is that your human capital expense is going to have to go up if you want to do this really well. Otherwise, you're putting a lot on one person's shoulders and you're probably going to get, you know, pretty meddling results um, in the, in the counter to that. Cause you know, admittedly we work with people that don't have the budgets of a New York Yankees, right? Obviously there are organizations that are going to be able to spend a lot more money on this kind of stuff. So if that's not your organization where you can hire somebody for, you know, a couple platforms, um, then focus on one or two, you know, don't expect this person to be posting everything that you do to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and TikTok say, you know what? We're going to focus on these really growthy platforms, which right now I see as TikTok primarily. Um, and I think Instagram is another great hub. You know, I, I sort of start to see it as a landing page for your organization where people can come and get an idea of what you're about. Um, focus on a couple and, you know, take off some work from that person's plate, understanding that there's a lot of work that goes into the couple platforms that they're going to be focusing on. Mm. Yeah. Or on the counter side that they hire a marketing agency like yourself, if you don't want to have that type of in-house, you know, human capital, so to speak, to outsource that, because it is, uh, I mean, it is costly to have, if you were going to have, let's say one TikTok manager, one Instagram manager, one content creator, one videographer, yeah. like th then you're, that's an expensive task. So do you think, what, what do you see there? Do you think it's better to have more in-house or more uh, agency work done? So you're obviously asking an agency owner um, yes. this question, but I, 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 <laughs> I, I, yeah, but I do think it's a, an interesting point of discussion. So I'll say a couple of things on this. The first thing, you know, obviously the, the, I'll get my biases out of the way. The benefit of an agency is that we bring in a lot of those roles that I just mentioned. Um, we 
take on the hiring expense and you pay us as an agency a flat cost, that probably is comparable to an, a single full-time employee. And you get the benefit of all of these different roles baked into that one flat cost. So, you know, for the cost of what it would cost you to hire one full-time employee, you get a graphic designer and a video editor and a content manager uh, and a community manager. Like you get all these things built in, right? So that's, you know, that's my bias out of the way. That's why we do what we do. That's how I see our value playing out. Uh, I don't think that makes sense for everybody though. You know, I think for a sports team specifically, there is some, I've, I've yet to put my finger on it really, but there's some like intangible piece that is just beneficial for there to be people on the ground with the team. Like, you know, the same way, team building is important in any team sport. You know, you don't want your, um, you know, your star player like flying on a separate private plane from the rest of their team because then it ostracizes the rest of the team and makes them, you know, feel superior, superior, inferior. I think is the same reason you wouldn't always want to hire an agency to do the work because oftentimes they're remote, you know, they're not in the thick of it with your team and your organization. And there's just a natural learning loss that happens with that. You're not there on a daily basis. You don't get to meet, understand the players or understand, you know, what they like to do and don't like to do and, and how you can take advantage most of their personality or what you should avoid. Like there is an inherent benefit to somebody being on the ground and, and being a part of that team essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just think it's, doesn't make sense for everybody. And I really do think you have to consider like, okay, is this a position that I can hire remote for? I think that's a, a, an understanding a lot of people have now is like remote versus in-person work. Um, and if you want that person to be in person, I think hiring agency probably probably isn't beneficial. But if you're an organization, you know, now I'll speak from personal experience. We work with a lot of organizations that um, are just remote, like a lot of leagues and governing bodies um, don't always have centralized locations. Um, you know, they have their league offices sort of spread out across the country. And in those cases, it makes total sense for us to work with them because um, they're already sort of remote based organizations and they already, you know, lead teams that are spread across the country. So us being remote isn't an added burden to that. But, you know, for a team that's located in a certain spot, they're really oftentimes at the benefit for uh, you to hire a person that can be there and, and really feel like they're a part of the team. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. And talking about that, you said that you work with, of course, your agency is working with the different sports organization and teams. And I just took two example, uh, Mike Up Football, for example, you have worked with, right? Sure. Yeah. So, so if you take like that example, what is it? Mm -hmm. uh, because you help grow their platform and, you know, uh, yeah, raise that. So what were some to make some, you know, real, real life examples? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll even use a better example for you. Okay. So, um, sure. We, we worked with a, or we still work with a, uh, an independent baseball league, uh, here in the Midwest part of America. Uh, it's called the American association of professional baseball. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll spare your audience, the, the nuances of, of professional baseball in America, but basically what you should understand is that there's the major league baseball track, and then there's the independent baseball track. So everybody's goal is to get to major league baseball at the mm. end of the day. It's for you, yeah. you know, make the most money. That's the biggest stage. Yeah. Uh, but to get there, you can do a bunch of different things. So the traditional way is to uh, go through the minor leagues. So each major league team has these lower level teams affiliated with them. Um, and you kind of work your way up the ladder. So you start at single A, then you go to double A, then you go to triple A, then you go to the major league. But sometimes for whatever reason, you're cut from that team or, you know, you didn't get drafted right away. So you're not on any of those teams, but you still want to play baseball and you still want to get recognized by scouts. So there are at this point, hundreds of independent teams across the country that pay their players, allow them to play professional baseball in really nice facilities um, and allow them to get in front of MLB scouts so that hopefully one day they could get signed by a team. That's the short version of it. So we work with one of these leagues, um, probably the premier league in America to for independent baseball. Um, and when we uh, started working with them, their content strategy was really focused on their segment of diehard fans. So every league kind of has, if you think about it in terms of like a circle or the core of, you know, think about the earth, for example, there's the core of the earth, you know, the, the smallest, most center part. Um, that's the, that, that was the segment of fans that they were working on. And as you got to the outside, you know, you talk about like casual baseball fans or just sports fans in general, um, you get into these bigger segment of fans. They weren't really thinking about um, those segments first. They're really only thinking about that core segment. So uh, what we did was we came in and we basically worked from that core out. So we said, okay, how can we better service this core group of fans? Um, and they were already doing a pretty good job at it. And we took those learnings and we said, okay, now how can we um, service uh, a broader segment of, of baseball fans? And to do that, it was implementing things like more video content. Um, it was taking more time to explain uh, records that were happening or 
playoff races that were happening or where different teams were in the standings and what that meant for the playoffs. Um, you know, where like different, uh, you know, different statistical races were happening. Like one player was leading the league in home runs, but there was another player really close behind him, that sort of stuff. So it was uh, taking a step back and saying, okay, what is it that all of these different segments of fans need? And let's just execute on it. And, and the way that looked, honestly, was just getting a lot more content out. Um, mm-hmm. They were kind of, you know, just posting the, I would say the bare minimum before we started working with them. And when we came in, we said, you know, we just need to up that capacity because they're in sports as a lot of people listening probably know there's just so much happening all the time that sometimes it means you just need to start communicating a little bit more. You know, you can be effective and be more efficient with your communications always, but um, it sometimes means just increase your output and doing more quantity. So um, that's what we did with them. And and, uh, in our second year, we really focused on um, as we grew that that segment of fans that we were focusing on, we really focused on, okay, how, now how can we build a deeper connection with these people that um, that we started to reach? And in doing that, we were um, taking more time to focus on players and their personalities and their backstories and you know what they meant in the communities they played in and what was important to them and all this sort of stuff. And um, as we come into our, our third year with them, we're really focusing on, okay, now how can we take this model that we know works, you know, we can communicate really effectively to a lot of people. And once we communicate to them, we can build depth and we can build engagement with them. So now we want to do that with more people. And we want to start working with um, baseball fans that don't even know we exist, but would really like our product if we could get in front of them. So that is in, that involves working with content creators and working, you know, trying to work with these bigger baseball media outlets that can help um, share the story of our players and our league and our teams and our communities um and you know take that model of of really good engaging content really visual impressive content and just getting it in front of more people um through content creators who already have the audiences that that we're trying to reach so it you know to me it really starts as starting with your core group learning what they like and um you know what works for them and just start building your way out to broader and broader audiences and uh trying to engage with them as deeply as possible along the way Mm. yeah i like that and also like so quality content and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, to increase your output more or less and to reach your target audience first and then build from there yeah exactly yeah that's good i like your uh, biology thing there also it felt like a neil degrasse tyson was here on the podcast for a minute <laughs> that's about as scientific as i get the uh don't ask me anything more about uh science or uh, you'll you'll realize the capacity of my of my knowledge is not very high <laughs> <laughs> it sounded convincing there at least okay great Awesome. So, uh, yeah, if we look a little bit about uh, you, uh, you mentioned your story there in the beginning where how you and your friend uh, was increasing this uh, Twitter account. But like, yeah. what's, what's your, um, I mean, how did you get interested in sports? I see you have a Packers uh, yeah, uh, behind you there. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you reached out to me, I think, after the, or we, we got in contact after the Andrew Brandt uh interview i think so i think that you, yeah you packers is uh, close to heart i guess i well yeah so i did grow up in green bay wisconsin so it mm. was like you're you're born into being a packers fan there it wasn't even yeah. much of a choice but uh you know for me sports were always like a you know an awesome way like you know, playing all throughout growing up like just a great way to connect with people mm. um it's probably more of an indictment of how us as men specifically choose to connect and, and build relationships with people, but having some sort of medium like sports to care about together and to you know be moving towards a common goal together, that mm-hmm. was really cool to me. Um, and as I started to realize, oh, I'm not good enough to do this for the rest of my life, I started looking for other ways where I could still feel those th- same things of like, you know, commonality towards a, a goal or feeling like you're participating in something bigger than yourself. I started looking at how I could impact that um, in, in a way that wasn't me playing the game, uh, cause that wasn't really that impressive. So, uh, it, I really found like being able to tell the stories of the people who played the game, um, I thought were really interesting avenues to get more people interested in it. So going all the way back to that Twitter account, you know, there were times where, uh, we would have kids reach out to us and be like, you know what, I follow your Twitter account. And I, you know, found out another kid at my school follows your Twitter account. It was just so cool to, talk about this post that you had, or like, you know, it really got me excited or hyped up to play my next game. Or it's like the ability to invoke emotions in people by sharing somebody's story. Or, you know, at the time it was sharing these like really cheesy motivational graphics. It was, it was so cool. It was like taking 
what was digital and in essence, not tangible, like you couldn't feel it. And then turning that into something that was tangible, like somebody coming up to you um, or somebody feeling an emotion like that connection was really cool. And like, I, I, I think I almost became addicted to, okay, how can I create stuff that doesn't really exist? Like only exists on the internet. It's floating around us. We can't really see it. And how can I turn that into something that is, um, like impactful and tangible. Uh, and for businesses, that means somebody coming out and buying a ticket and spending money and, and coming to a game. But for a long time that, you know, there was no money attached to that for me. It was just like having people come up to me and saying, Hey, I really liked what you did there. That was really cool. Or, Hey, this made me feel happy or sad or angry. Like it invoked an emotion in me that, that sort of connection of in, intangible to tangible, I, I, I sort of became addicted with. And I think that's kind of what led me to, to doing what I'm doing now, which is, something I get to do every day, which is hopefully evoke positive emotions in people, or if not just something that they can think about or, you know, spend some of their time, uh, you know, focusing on if, if their life, you know, if their life wants to go that direction. The creative uh, side of you, has that always been there? Is that something that has uh, grown with this interest for telling stories? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it has always been there. I, I I would say if I, you know, if on the left brain, right brain side, the, the right brain obviously being a, a, a bit more creative. I, I think I'm a, still a pretty analytical person. Um, I like to, you know, I'm not, not so, you know, this is just me now breaking down stereotypes. But when I think of like this really creative type, ethereal person who can kind of just do things on a whim and, you know, come up with these creative concepts, I'm definitely not like that. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think I look at, um, I look at sports or I look at anything through like a lens of, okay, how can I make this more appealing to more people? Um, and I think in that sense, um, I def there, I always had been a creative side of me. I I've come to realize because, um, uh, yeah, even when I, when I was younger, like telling those stories I always found were, were interesting and in, in what drew me in, not necessarily the, you know, the, the physical spectacle of, of it all, but, um, you know, what it meant to somebody or, um, how I was able to, receive that information was always uh, almost more no, no, noteworthy to me. So as I've gotten older and sort of reflected on how I've gotten here. I have realized that that creative part has always been ticking. Um, it's just shown itself in different ways. And now obviously we have all these really cool tools, you know, Adobe suite to these really nice cameras to, to tell stories. And, and I, and I've been drawn to that. Mm, I see. Yeah, it's an interesting. I've asked myself that as well because I've never seen myself as a very creative person. But then mm -hmm. they say, "Ah, oh, but you you have a podcast and you have this and you have that." But you know, yeah, what is creativity in the end? And I, as you said this first, when you said like with the stereotypes, I don't see myself as the stereotypically creative person. But of yeah. course, everyone has their own creative creativity in in some way. Yeah, I think there's really a lot of creativity that's baked into being a curious person. Mm -hmm. Um, like I, I wouldn't describe myself as being creative more than I am curious. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I find that when I get embedded with that nugget of curiosity about any topic, you know, I can go down rabbit holes on, on anything that I then get this urge to share that bit of curiosity with other people. And that often manifests itself in some creative element. So it might not be, I'm the best, you know, videographer or video editor or graph designer, and so for my, some people, you know, when they get bit with that curiosity bug, maybe they have to tell that story through um, a, a, a graphic, or maybe they have to tell that story through a long written piece. Um, you know, for me, I just have tried to find ways that suit me best to get that curiosity or that information out of me. Um, in a lot of ways, it's come to like video or, or come to talking because I think those are are some of my stronger suits. But um, it's almost like a byproduct of my curiosity, not I've started with the intent of being creative and then I, you know, find what works. I start with the intent of being curious and, and trying to be somebody who learns a lot. And then I feel the need to get that information out of me. So for me, that has been, you know, talking to people like you or, or talking on video. Uh, and, and that's just been my, my outlet, but, uh, it's a downstream effect of, of, of my curiosity, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes uh, perfect sense. And, uh, I would say that's the same for me, that it's the curio curiosity that uh, feeds it. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of interesting cases from sports marketing. And uh, you mentioned to me before we hit record here about one case with the Savannah Banana. Yeah. So uh, you do you just want to give your two cents on that? Or if there is another you know, sports marketing case right now that you feel is extra interesting? 
Yeah. So I think the Savannah Bananas is is something I've, or a team I've made a lot of content about. And I think in the sports marketing world, a lot of your listeners probably have heard of them at the very least and maybe don't fully know who they are or what they do. Um, so the, the quick synopsis is that they started as a summer collegiate baseball team, um, just a place for college baseball players to go to keep playing baseball and, and training in the summer. Uh, they're just a part of one of these leagues and their owner uh, bought the team with the intention of making it successful. I, I think when he bought it, he leveraged his mortgage against it to try to make it work because he believed in this vision of making baseball fun is sort of his ethos. His name is Jesse Cole. And so uh, in buying the team, he he started by just doing really anything off the wall to get people to come to games. You know, he dresses up in a yellow tuxedo. Um, he does these ridiculous um, in between inning shows where he has like, you know, grandmas coming out and dancing in their like grandma cheerleading squad or they have a dad bod cheerleading squad or they get, you know, men that are not in the best shape to to dance in between innings. And they have all these sort of like kitschy spectacle, um, you know, circus type uh, mm. circus type things that happen in between their games. And he just kept Jesse Cole, just kept going down this line of like, how can I make people have more and more fun at our games? And so it's like, to the point of curiosity, it seemed like this natural path of like, okay, I see that this thing is working. Now, what can I do better to make it work even better? Um, and he talks a lot about, you know, analyzing when people left the games and how he could make sure he was, you know, I, I see it the same way as like optimizing for retention on a YouTube video. You want somebody to watch as long as possible so that it does really well in the algorithm. He was optimizing for retention at his baseball games where he's like, okay, if somebody leaves in the seventh inning, what can I do here to make sure they stay to the very end? Um, and so they do all sorts of ridiculous things. Um, one of which being like at the end, the players all come out in front of the stadium, they get a marching band and they have like this big party in front of the stadium. And that's an incentive for people to stay till the end. Cause they get to meet all the players and hear the band play and have this big party. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the synopsis, but all that is to say, uh, it, it's like a really interesting case study right now in the sports marketing world about how you get people to care about what you do. Uh, and my perspective on it is that it is really just him showing and not telling. So I think the trap that a lot of sports teams specifically fall into is telling you what they have going on and just expecting to come back to what we said at the very beginning, expecting that there's, there are these baked in, like there's this baked in caring that people have to be like, okay, all I need to do is get them the information and they're going to care because we're a sports team. So they're going to come regardless because, you know, we're the, we're the thing that's going on in town. And I see that with, you know, a lot of professional teams where it's like, okay, we're the only professional baseball team in town. You know, you could sub in any sport, I suppose, but I'll use baseball. You know, we're the only professional baseball team in town. So we're just going to tell people where to buy tickets, how, how much they are. And, you know, they're going to buy them, but they're not going to buy them. But that's all our job is, is to get them that information. And what I think the Savannah Bananas have done and what they've shown is that if you can show people a really unique and fun experience, they will go out and find that information on their own. So if you look at the Savannah Bananas Instagram feed or uh, you know, TikTok, you will never see a ticket promotion where it's like, hey, go to savannabananas.com and buy these tickets because they're 10% off. Um, all you see is how fun the games are and how ridiculous the things they do are. And in doing that, there's a natural curiosity. And we as online consumers are now smart enough to understand I can just type in Savannah Bananas to Google and I can find the information if I need to find it. They don't have to force feed that to me. Uh, and I think a lot of teams can start moving in that direction of showing the experience, showing the players, um, showing what the stakes are, uh, building this world around whatever it is that they do uh, and not force feeding people information and just assuming they're going to care because they're a sports team. Uh, I think they're in, in a sense, the Savannah Bananas are actually a really uh, humble organization. I think a lot of people see them as like in your face and braggadocious, but I think they're a really humble organization where they're like, Hey, you know, we're not deserving of anybody coming to our games. So we have to show to you why you should come to our games uh, and we'll let you make that decision on your own. And then you can go, you know, find that information and, and buy tickets. And it's worked for them. They have a waiting list of 500,000, half a million people to get to one of their games. And they, oh, wow. this year are doing a 33 city world tour. They sell out all the games within, you know, a couple of days of their, uh, of their tickets going on sale. And so they're going to have millions of people coming to see them play in all these cities across the country. And they have half a million people waiting to buy tickets. And Again, I, I think it's really astounding. If you're a sports marketer, you should go look at their Instagram because nowhere will you see 
a graphic that says, you know, go buy tickets from us because they don't need to do it. You know, they've done such a good job at showing you what the experience is like, the natural curiosity and how mature the online consumer is now, they will go find the tickets and half a million people have and are sitting on a waiting list now to go get the chance to see them play because they've done such a good job uh, fulfilling that value proposition of, you know, why you should come in the first place. That's incredible. And I feel like that uh, ties back a little bit to what we talked about before with like organic versus paid. That when yeah. it's paid, it's paid is sort of like in your face, like come buy our tickets versus this is, mm -hmm. is, you know, showing the great experience. This is what you can expect. And then, as you said, like consumers today are so smart that they can, you know, Google and find, find the tickets anyway. Yeah. I mean, I would like pay so much money to see the back end of the Savannah Bananas, like, you know, CRM or like how much data they have on their consumers, because to the point of paid versus organic, they've done such a good job on organic. They never need to you know, spend a money, spend a dollar on paid ads in their life uh, because everybody already knows who they are. Uh, but I'm sure that there's a really interesting play there for them where it's like, you know, retargeting their consumers and making them uh, fans for a longer period of time, like making sure that they don't just come to a game and forget they ever exist. I think that's really important for them, but also finding ways to monetize their fans in different ways. Cause that's a, you know, that's been a struggle for sports teams and organizations forever. It's like once somebody leaves your, stadium or your field it's like how do you how do you you know how do you get them to spend money with you um and i think the bananas could you know i, I know they have a six-figure merchandise business and you know they could probably sell their streaming rights to name the network for however much money and so like there's now all of these ways that they've been enabled by um, their really solid organic strategy to monetize on on the back end with some sort of a of, of paid strategy to to make these people fans that go even deeper than just following them on tiktok yeah could be a good case study for other teams to follow as well. Yeah. And, and I think like one thing that teams should realize, it's interesting when you talk about the bananas, you get people, you get two camps of people who know about them. You get the people who are like, they're ridiculous. They're bad for baseball. Like we'll never be the Savannah bananas. Or you'll get people that are like, why aren't we like this? Like we need to do more of what they're doing, blah, 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 blah. And there's a million things I could say about both of those camps. But really what it comes down to is that there just exists a spectrum in professional sports. And the Savannah bananas are on the far side of the spectrum where they're making their own rules. They literally invented their own brand of baseball where they have nine completely different rules that are not in the traditional game. And so they're playing in their own sandbox. They can do whatever the heck they want. Um, and on the other side is like a major league baseball where they have a lot of rules and they have to follow a lot of you know tradition and stuff like that. And I just encourage teams to look at one, where they exist on that spectrum, it's teams at any sport, where do you exist on that spectrum? And if you want to move towards the bananas, how can you move closer to that side? You don't have to be completely on that side, but I can, how can you move closer to that side um, and do more things like them without, you know, understanding that you're never going to be exactly like them? Yeah. Yeah. So I said, I think it's a good uh, case study and uh, mm -hmm. much to learn from them from both ends. I'm sure there'll be a lot of a lot of talk about them in in marketing classes in the future. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, something that I ask everyone is: uh, Have you had any bumps on the road in your career? And if so, how did you overcome mm -hmm. them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I certainly have. Uh, you know, I think when I look back at my bumpiest times, uh, I think it was just me going after things that weren't aligned with, uh, you know, what I knew my 18 month or five year vision to be. Um, it was chasing a short term benefit, you know, usually like money um, to satisfy some arbitrary need of like, okay, I need to be making this amount of money. Um, this was especially prevalent when I was a freelancer. And so I you know, knew how much money I probably would have made in a full-time job and kind of wanted to make that same amount of money as a freelancer. Um, understanding it, you know, being a freelancer didn't come with a lot of other benefits like in America, you know, health insurance primarily. So um, I think a lot of times I would say yes to opportunities because I knew they would pay me, even though I was, didn't think they were going to be the best opportunity to further my professional career. But I always thought about them as band-aid solutions. And I'm like, okay, eventually I'll, you know, figure out what to what to do about this. Um, and, you know, I, I know I'm not going to do it forever, but for right now it's good. Um, and I think those are the things, not that I regret them the most, but that I just, you know, I would maybe not do them again. Um, and I'm definitely a lot more picky about the things I say yes to and the things I say no to. Um, and I try to think about how they fit into that, you know, 18 month or five year plan um, and how they forward my goals. You know, a lot of times you can't see that far in the horizon and you don't see how things can be beneficial for you, but 
I think there are clear opportunities or clear landmines that I've stepped on in my career where I knew in the moment it wasn't a good fit for me. Um, I know looking back, it wasn't a good fit for me, but still I did it for, you know, reasons that were uh, contra to what some of my goals were. And so, you know, for me, it was understanding like, okay, why am I doing this? What's the kind of life that I'm trying to live um, in doing this? You know, like that includes my personal life or my relationships with, you know, the, the people I care about. Um, you know, how do I want to build that life for myself? And then how can I sort of reverse engineer my work life, understanding I'm going to spend a lot of time working naturally? How can I reverse engineer that part to, to fit into all the rest? Um, and I haven't realized that until lately. And uh, now that I've started thinking about it, it started to make a lot of those decisions um, in my professional life a lot clearer, uh, understanding, you know, where I want to be personally and, uh, you know, in relationships and health wise and all that sort of stuff um, has helped me sort of reverse engineer and, and design what I want my professional life to look like. Yeah. It's a good lesson, but also like it's easier now, I guess, to say no to some opportunities. Maybe in the beginning, you don't have that type of luxury to turn things down, even though you think, you know, it's not the best opportunity, but it's still, as you said, like it pays the bills and it might, mm -hmm. you know, open some other doors. Yeah, I think, you know, I was fortunate enough early on to like come into a pretty solid base of client work where I wasn't mm -hmm. like scrapping to pay my bills. So that, that, that was fortunate mm -hmm. for me. And I think like looking back at it, I like, I'm a firm believer that even if there's not experience that you're getting paid for that you want to, that you want to get, like there there's places that you can get it. Um, you know, whether that be like, you know, I talk about the story of me starting a Twitter account when I was in high school, like nobody, I wasn't getting paid to do that, but I was still learning a lot of really valuable skills that became really marketable for me down the line. And so I think looking back at that, like understanding that, you know, what was a couple hundred dollars a month more going to do for me, in the long term, where maybe I could have spent that time and avoided that headache and focused on building my skills in a way that I wasn't going to get paid for, but were going to be more valuable for me. And you're right, like it's total hindsight, this 2020. Um, but I, I now come into opportunities like that, where, you know, I, I don't only look at the dollars and cents of it all and say, okay, this is going to pay me more, I'm going to do this thing. I understand what my financial situation is, which I'm very lucky to be in where I'm not scraping to pay bills. And I can say, okay, I can now look at this decision where, where is it going to lead me, you know, 18 months down the line, or where's it going to lead me a year down the line? And do I think I'm going to be better off for it? And it's not just money that goes into making that decision. Yeah. I think that's smart. Is there something that I haven't asked you yet that you feel is important to mention? Hmm. I think, uh, that last point that I just made just led me like led me to think about this whole idea of getting experience in this industry, uh, like sports specifically. Uh, it's obviously super competitive. Um, unfortunately, people that hire in this industry take that competition to mean the supply is really or the demand is really high, and therefore they can you know supply the work at a lesser cost, which is a bit of a bummer. You know, you, people that work in this industry are often are compensated less than their peers um, in other industries and um, work way more hours, which is a, a bummer. So, um, but understanding all that, you know, all that is to say rather that there aren't a lot of jobs for a lot of people that want to work in sports. And I think a lot of people should consider what kind of career they want to have or, you know, where they want to be in a couple of years. And maybe you think that working for a team or a league is a really good experience right away. Um, or maybe you don't even think you can work for them because you don't have the experience because you haven't been able to find it. Um, I think it's really valuable to just do the stuff on your own first. Um, you know, learn the skills on your own first. I, I'm a huge proponent of somebody like starting an Instagram page and trying to grow that or starting a TikTok page now and trying to grow that and doing that on the back of your graphic design that you're trying to learn or your video editing skills, or maybe you want to be a short form content creator, like do that for yourself first, understanding you're not going to get paid for it do it as a hobby, do it because you like to do it and because you're genuinely interested in it. And the opportunities will come, you know, your understanding of how you want to attack your professional life and the kind of opportunities you want to look for, that will all come to you a lot easier if you're doing this stuff on your own first. I think a lot of people have this like analysis by paralysis or they think that their career in sports is going to be linear. Like I'm going to get an entry level job, then I'm going to move up, I'm going to move up and like so on and so on. But it's not linear and you can skip a lot of steps if you just start doing the work without caring if it's perfect or without caring if it's 
you know, even if you're getting paid for it, if you're able to be in that position, um, I would just take action first and then feel out the rest of it, you know, feel out how the opportunities come or, um, you know, how you even like doing it, like figure that all out after you've done the work, because until you do that, you're never going to know if you like it, what you want to do, you know, how much you want to make, like all of that stuff is very secondary to even liking the work in the first place, because a lot of people that work in sports, that's the top reason they want to work in it because they think the subject matter is interesting. And they think like, you know, even if I work a crappier job, at least I'm interested in what I'm doing. So make sure you're interested in what you're doing. Um, and, you know, make sure you're, you have a proclivity to, to doing it because you're going to be doing a lot of it if, if you have a, a career. Yeah. I love that. And uh, especially the anal- paralysis by analysis, like uh, looking at my own, you know, with a podcast that would never have happened if I would have thought about it too long. And uh, not that it's a Joe Rogan experience right now, but looking back on the first kind of episodes, you see like, you know, you improve all the time and you take learnings and you to get the first, you know, get started and then you learn mm-hmm. as you go. I think that's uh, great. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, failing's the, <laughs> failing is the second fastest way to learn how to do something besides just getting it right the first time. So you totally have to do that. Uh, and, and I really think these days too, like aside from the, you know, like, the point I made was a very ethereal, like, yes, sounds good in theory point. But I really do think that if you want to get hired in a very competitive industry, having everything to your name as you can, like, you know, having all the experience, all the social proof that you can is really important in our, like, it's those things that can really set you apart uh, from the compet from the people you're competing with to get a certain job. Like if all things are equal and I see that I'm hiring for a sports content creator position and one person on their own time, uh, on their own volition grew a TikTok account to a hundred thousand po- followers and the other person didn't. Well, of course I'm going to hire the person that grew their account to a hundred thousand followers. So, yeah. you know, aside from the whole, like figuring out what you want, kind of, you know, hippie stuff, like practically that just looks great on your resume and it shows a lot of initiative about you, but then it also shows a lot of the, the practical skills of, you know, you're getting hired for hopefully what you're doing on your own. Uh, and it's really like a great differentiator. And as we talk about a super competitive industry. Yeah, it is for sure. And what you said with a uh, low pay and uh, long hours and all of that, but uh, it is a great industry and uh, I for one like to work in it, but as you say, it might be tough, especially in the beginning. Totally. <laughs> the last question that I ask everyone is if uh, you could choose the next guest on this podcast, who do you think I should talk to? Oh, man. I think uh, there's this really interesting undercurrent of uh, content creators in sports. So as I talk about the benefit of having this experience, you know, outside of like a traditional linear progression in your career. Um, I think a lot of people are able to work in sports, able to work their own hours, able to get paid a lot by creating content in sports. And if you've taken anything from (laughs) this conversation, it's that, you know, there's no better time than right now to be creating content. Um, And so I I would love if you could talk to um, somebody I've gotten to know pretty well in the last couple of months. His name is Lawson McDonald. He is uh, one of the hockey guys. Uh, They're a TikTok account that has over a million followers and, you know, they have a couple hundred thousand followers on all these other platforms and they're able to do some of the coolest stuff in sports, like stuff that, you know, when you work in sports, you're like, this is, you know, I want to go to these games and I want to go to these kind of events and they're getting paid to go there, um, you know, just because they've been able to build a following. And, and I think it's really a testament one to like where the industry is going, where it's like, if you have the ability to command attention and to grow an audience and grow an engaged audience, people will pay for that and people will find that valuable. Um, and two, you know, just the way that Lawson thinks about content and thinks about growth and just, you know, thinks about his career as a, as a content creator is really interesting because now we're starting to see all these people who are making a full-time living, sitting in front of a camera and talking, and we've never seen that before. And that's got to be so daunting and scary to figure out, um, you know, as you're, as you're going about doing it, because there's nobody to look ahead and be like, oh, this person's like been doing that. And this is kind of the the career path. Like it's, it's a totally new thing. And I think the way he thinks about it is, is really smart and, and really unique and, the experiences that he's had with, with the rest of the hockey guys have, has been really cool. So I'd love if, if you could talk to Lawson. Uh, he, he's a smart guy and I'd be happy to get you guys connected. Yeah. Thank you. That sounds very interesting. I would like that. Yeah. Awesome. Tyler, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the sports management podcast. Thank you, Marcus. I really appreciated it.